All right, hello everyone. All right, I apologize for the late start. Uh, we had some login issues, but we are all here now. So we just want to start off and just thank you for joining us here tonight. Um, we, I do see a lot of familiar faces and also some faces that, for the, um, uh, I guess not so familiar faces, but we just thank you. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and get started right away. So we have all the speakers here today. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, we can just go around and let me just introduce each person and then we can just do a quick introduction. So uh, uh, we have Charles here today. So Charles, go ahead and introduce yourself briefly. Uh, so good evening. Thank you all so much for uh, joining us this evening. My name is Charles Grace and I'm actually the Senior Student Services Manager, otherwise known as the Head of Student Services for Christian Alliance International School. Yes, we also have Kirsty as well. Kirsty. Oh, sorry. Um, are you? Oh, unable to. Uh, hold on a minute. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Miss Kirsty. Like you should like. Uh, I should be a familiar face with your children, right? So I'm the one who teaching your child's health and well-being if they are studying PAP to grade four. I'm the primary mm -hmm. school counselor. Hi. <laughs> All right, and also we have for our speaker this morning, we're going to have uh, uh, Mr. Alex McCoy, who is from St. I'm sorry, you should do the introduction. Sorry, go ahead. Yes. And it's oh. evening, by the way, Sam. Yes. Oh, sorry, good. I'm sorry. Keep... sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Uh, my name's Alex McCoy. I'm a uh, senior minister at St. Andrew's Church in Kowloon, just on Nathan Road. Thank you. And uh, lastly, but certainly not least, we have uh, Mr. Vanderpile as well joining us. So go, um, I don't know. Yeah, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, Sam, Sam, you introduce yourself and then I'll do the welcome. And okay, then... all right. Sure thing. Yes. Um, so go. yeah, my name is uh, Samuel Lee and I'm teaching grade six uh, and I will be just moderating for tonight. And so thank you for joining us. Yep. Great. Well, good, e good evening, everyone, and it's lovely to, uh, to have so many of you just joining us tonight for our very first parent education event. Uh, as you know, this is part of the initiative from the School Council, and we've really wanted to look and to see how can we build a relationship and a very strong home and school relationship. And so it's just wonderful for this to be the first event, and I think for me, arguably, a really important topic in this uh, this time and this day and age in which we live. So I'm very grateful to uh, Charles Grayson and also to Kirsty Chung for their evening, but their expertise. And Alex, my thanks to you for opening up this evening with a, a devotion from God's Word. Um, I, I just look saw some of the names, and I just want to do one shout out. I think Mark Mark Siu is sitting there, and I think he was a winner today. A winner. I think he won a Peppa Pig, but um, I've got to bring it in. I've got to bring it in on Monday. So don't worry, Mark. I've got a note to remind me. But for everyone else, it is just lovely to have you join us and uh, really do wish you the Lord's blessing as you listen to a very, very important topic this evening. Alex, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Richard. Good evening again, everyone. Um, the New Testament is remarkably sparse on insights into the practical aspects of parenting. Uh, perhaps one of the closest spots that we get is actually a, 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 the discourse between uh, the Apostle Paul and Timothy. Uh, now, that might seem a little bit strange because Timothy wasn't Paul's son. Um, but if you read through the letters, you see this incredibly intimate bond between the two of them. Uh, Paul knows Timothy really well. They have a lot of backstory. Paul speaks about uh, Timothy's journey of faith, his mother, his grandmother, who are believers. Uh, Paul speaks about Timothy's character, that he's incredibly timid, that he's anxious, uh, a lot weighs on his heart. He, he speaks about um, occasions that they've had when Timothy's been moved to tears. Uh, he speaks also about their, their common bond in the ministry. Paul was Timothy's mentor. Um, really, even up to about 100 years ago, uh, your vocation, chances are that was your father's vocation, and your father taught you your vocation. And this is what Paul has been doing, doing with Timothy. Um, he knows Timothy back to front, and he, he speaks with him about his ministry, and he's trained him. Uh, and we see most particularly that Paul often calls Timothy, my beloved son. It's an incredibly intimate relationship. And so I think we get some guide here. Sam's going to put up 
uh, a Bible passage, 2 Timothy 3, uh, 10 to 17, and I'm just going to read it for us. You should be able to see it on your screens. Uh, Paul says uh, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 10, You, however, Timothy, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And in how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's a pretty familiar passage uh, to a lot of us, but I just want to quickly draw out two principles as Paul is uh, Timothy's spiritual father. Uh, first of all, is this idea of mentoring. Um, Timothy has seen Paul's priorities. He's seen them uh, modeled to him. Uh, Timothy says, you, have seen, you know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. Timothy has seen everything about Paul's life. Paul has modeled it to him. Now, for better or worse, um, you don't need to show it anymore, Sam. Uh, for better or worse... Our, um, our children see our example. They see the priorities of their parents. Uh, what parents value and prioritize most will be seen by their children. So a, a child will see how his father treats his mother. He'll see how his father spends his time. He'll see how his father most freely spends his money. He sees what his father gets excited about, what he spends a lot of his time talking about. Um, if Jesus is the most important figure in someone's life, a child will be able to see it. Um, now that happens for better or worse. I can think of just a, a, a few examples where I've seen where a parent might have said that they're a Christian, but they'll model something differently to their child. Uh, many years ago, I had a friend who moved from, I'm from Sydney, wonderful part of the world, um, who uh, I had a friend who moved from one part of Sydney, the north, to the south. Now, uh, he moved from a church that I went to with him to another part of Sydney, could have found a church quite easily, but spent a long time finding that church. Um, uh, eventually, it took him uh, almost a year and a half. And, and I was saying to our, our, our old pastor, you know, I'm, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about what influence it'll have. And the, the pastor said, listen, He'll, he'll probably remain a Christian, but his children will struggle um, because the children saw that getting involved with Christian community, uh, being part of, of church wasn't a big aspect of his life. Another example, um, my, my uh, wife's cousins are wonderful rugby players. They ended up uh, representing Australia in underage rugby. Um, but growing up, uh, through uh, school, their parents, whom were both Christians, uh, made a choice because a lot of rugby in Australia is played on Sundays. Um, it's obviously a conflict with youth group, with, with, with uh, church and all that type of stuff. It happened that those boys, uh, whilst they were believers at an early age, uh, didn't end up going um, through youth group, through church and all that type of stuff. Uh, it wasn't modelled to them the importance of prioritizing Jesus, uh, and eventually they gave away their faith. Um, our children see what's most important to us, and Paul says to Timothy, you have seen my way of life. But secondly, he talks to them about um, the priority of Scripture. Our modeling will be seen in how we're devoted to uh, Scripture. Um, we share our priorities in how we share God's Word with our children. Now, I say this as, as a father, uh, as a pastor, uh, but also as a former high school teacher and a former school chaplain. Um, we can't outsource our spiritual parenting to the school. Uh, the primary responsibility 
is for parents. We outsource all sorts of things in Hong Kong, but this thing we must not outsource. Um, you're going to a school that prioritizes Christian education. It's a wonderful thing. And it's a wonderful thing, thing that you're all uh, setting aside part of your Friday evening to learn more about this. Uh, that's really essential. Um, but our, our first priority as parents, um, apart from everything else, provision and companionship, is to show our, our children how we prioritize God's word. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we have three sons. Um, they're 17 and 15 and 15 now. Uh, we've tried to read the Bible with our children ever since they could sit at the table. And I'll be honest with you, you know, sometimes it's been a zoo. Um, it's, you know, things have fallen apart. Our kids have been naughty or distracted or the attention span of a goldfish. But basically, any from the time they could sit up, we tried to read the Bible and have devotional times at dinner. Uh, they won't remember probably, you know, even a handful of those devotionals that we did. But the point was they remembered that we did it, that we prioritized them. Uh, we read the Bible. We talked about what we're thankful for. And we prayed with one another. Um, you might have different ways of doing that. A friend of mine um, reads the Bible with his kids first thing in the morning at the breakfast table. My wife speaks about how her father, who was a head of a department at a, at a major Sydney hospital, would come home each evening and before she went to bed, he'd read the Bible and pray with her. And half the time he'd fall asleep uh, next to her bed. He was so tired. Uh, you prioritize uh, your devotion to Jesus by sharing God's word with them. That's two major things, modeling and scripture. Uh, much more to talk about, uh, much more to say. But how about I pray for us as you continue your evening? Uh, loving God and Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, for the example of your servant, Paul, to Timothy, uh, that Paul uh, showed what it looked like to prioritize Jesus and to live for him. Uh, Lord, we confess our own inadequacies. Um, we have so many competing demands and attentions, particularly in a fairly hectic place like Hong Kong. We need your help. Uh, so guide us and empower us by your spirit. We pray that our homes are nurseries for heaven and that you guide us as we teach and encourage and model to our children what it looks like to follow you. We thank you for this opportunity uh, to learn more this evening, how we can be Christian parents. Uh, do guide and direct our discussion, we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and just um, just start out by just sharing um, uh, just the schedule for today. So um, we just had our sharing today from, uh, from Alex, and then right now we're going to have um, Kirsty speak about building independence and responsibility. Um, and then Charles will continue with motivation and learning. Um, and then afterwards you can follow the schedule and then hopefully by the end of today, we'll have a 10 minute uh, Q and A session. Um, so let me just go ahead and just direct you real quickly to this page. So, um, what I'd like for you to do is if you are, if you do have your phone with you, you can scan this code and during the discussion, uh, during the, um, the presentation, um, you can go ahead and just um, type in questions using uh, this um, this uh, site. Um, you don't need to um, download anything. All you need to just scan and then just um, ask any questions. So during the um, during the presentations, you may have questions. Just post it, and then at the end of the session, we'll try to answer uh, those questions with you. So just take a. Um, I'll just give you another maybe thirty seconds to just go ahead and just um, use your phone just to scan the code and if you want to just go ahead and just um, um, do that then we'll just do that for just another 20 more seconds and then we'll carry on with the presentations. Oh, all right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just continue on. I'm going to pass uh, pass it over to uh, Kirsty. So, Kirst uh, Miss, you can go ahead and um, yes, started. Yes, go ahead. Okay, let's get started. So, um, 
uh, one other topic today we are going to talk about is like building independency and responsibility, right? So uh, <clears throat> uh, we, uh, in the survey, a lot of you respond uh, that you were interested in this area, right? But uh, we today, like uh, most of our um, topic cover will be uh, primary oriented because like um, we have a uh, big, a large portion that like respond from the survey is from a primary. So, um, <clears throat> so when we're talking about independency and responsibility, it's still like, like we all have one dream, right? So the dreams like maybe is like, oh, I so wish that my child can manage their homework by their own. So I can just like come home, sit back and relax, right? This is one of many parents' dreams. And other dream is like, oh, I wish my child can like put down the device when they like just, they said five minutes is five minutes. So, and when it's, the time is there, like, or oh, even the time is not finished at all, oh, he will say, oh, I'm done with this, then they will walk away. So this is our dreams. Like, we are not saying that this is not possible. Both are possible, it takes time. And is it because like small step lead to big change? So it is a matter like how we trying to encourage them to step through that focus, okay? And when we talk about step, it's good to know that where we were now, right? They now maybe they just don't want to start their homework. And maybe they feel like that they can't do it. So we can see from this side, that like uh, from I won't do it and I can't do it until the top that yes, yes, I did it. That is, there are many, many steps. So it takes loads of encouragement for us to encourage them step by step. We do expect that they can manage them by themselves, but like um, it is hard like just for them to just jump off steps and reaching the top without our help, okay? So um, to, when we talk about independency, um, we can, it is, this is the sequence. So eventually we want them to be independent, right? So we start from building up them, their competence. More competence means that they're more confident, more confidence that they more feel like that they can be independent, right? So we will talk about type of competence today. Um, the one on the left, like behavioral competence, it means like uh, life skills and resilience, like how the children's problem solving. And it also includes their uh, emotional management, like uh, whether they can take, they feel like they can take care of themselves. Can they solve the problem by themselves? or like related to the social skills. So all this like be, uh, belongs to behavioral competence, which means it's life skills and resilience. Another type of competence is functional competence. Functional competence, like uh, if it is in uh, organizations, it means like uh, are you equip like not professional knowledge, but like a basic knowledge to work in an office. Uh, maybe it's my, more like a teamwork. Can you work with others? Or maybe are you familiar with all the office equipment? So this is the, like the functional competence. And but for, for at school, it's more like um, to be like, do they, how do they organize their time? How could they organize their textbook, worksheet and homework? And it's also about like um, whether they can manage the study skills. Like we, we cannot like, um, I think like you did, did like uh, heard before when we were young, we, when we were young, like someone would tell us like, oh, you don't know, you do know that concept. You just don't know how to, uh, the exam, uh, exam skills, how to write the key point for to get a point, right? Those kind of things are our study skills that like uh, our children need to learn in order to succeed. So the last one, the last competent, the last type of competence is professional competence. In school-wise, that means it's academic achievement. They need that, they need that, like, so that they can like um, be succeeded. They could, that all the performance are related to this competence. But most of the time, most of the time, we spend a lot of time building in professional competence. Uh, and they were like, um, we didn't spend as much time as we need for the others too, okay? So, but and when we talk about whole person development, 
you can see that knowledge and skills, like right? knowledge and skills that is include like uh, the sport, like right? uh, some of our students, they spend a lot of time in sport, music, art, that are good, right? But if you can see this table, knowledge and skills is only like a very small portions out of the whole person development. Like if we're talking about a whole person development, we want our children to be all rounded. There are a lot of life skills that need to nurture like before they get on the needs, okay? And so where should we start? <laughs> it is always good to start with an end in my, our mind, right? If we have a very clear goal that we want to reach, so we will know that like uh, where our directions is and uh, where we're going. And we all can always keep track that uh, uh, whether we are on the right track. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> what are the right track? Sam, can you put in next slide, please? So these are nine signs that your kids is a confidence kid, right? I want, they, I want to go through you one by one. Uh, and because these are like your ending goal, right? If you can see this kind of sign, that means you are on the right track. No, um, okay. The first one is they take risks. Um, taking risks not, doesn't mean that you put, that they put themselves in danger. It means that they are willing to try new things, right? They don't feel hesitate. They feel like they, uh, I feel like I can try it. Like I may observe a little bit, but I feel like I can try it, that it is the taking risk. Second one is the setting goal. They set goals, okay? Um, kids with confidence, they look for the desire, then they were encouraged to go after what they want, okay? Um, and also the ability to set a realistic goal is a sign of confidence because they're not just dreaming. I want to be Obama one day, or, just, or I want to be billionaire tomorrow. So those are not re re uh, uh, realistic goals, right? Setting realistic goal, let's say like, um, I want to learn how to swim this summer. This is a realistic goal, right? They, they feel like they want to achieve something they want, okay? Um, the third one is they reach milestone. Reaching milestone means they don't give up. When they have set the goal, they don't give up. And, uh, and they're happy that they master uh, not they, they don't need to be at the top of the game in that area, but they set milestone. Like when they learn how to ride bicycle, right? They start from tricycle to on like uh, four wheels and eventually they can ride normal bicycle. So they feel proud of their achievement or maybe they can like later do tricks with the bicycle. Okay? So these are like um, when they were reaching milestone, uh, they, they, they feel, when they feel more confident, they will like keep reaching the next and next one and the next and next one. Okay. Uh, number four is they make decision without your help. Okay. This kind of decision is not like they make silly decisions or they just want to take control of their life. Like I want 10 hours screen time per day, right? This is not that kind of decisions. Uh, we are talking about when they feel that they can take control of the certain area of their life. They know that they can make their own decisions on certain area, like uh, what I'm going to wear. Like I want to plan my breakfast or I want to plan my weekend. I want to like plan my time like in a, in a positive way, okay? Number four is like the making decisions, okay? Number five, number five is to adapt uh, and form many uh, situ social situations. Like this apply when you ha need to have to have a lot of observations. Let's say when your kids been to a um, completely new environment, right? Sometimes we encourage them right away. But if you want to know that whether your kids have confidence in this area, then you will have to like sit back and observe. Um, some of the confidence kids, like they, they would just take a little bit, a uh, little bit time on observing what others are doing. And they, they try to join in, right? But some of them, they so hesitate. Some of them, they just can't even like, they will reject the idea like, 
or I'm not going to that party because like it would be so awkward and I don't have friends there and things like that. So kids with confidence, they will willing to like try, uh, try to adapt and they know how to adapt like unfamiliar social situations. Six, you will be surprised. <laughs> kids with confidence, they enjoy responsibility. Responsibility means like when you ask them to take care of some of the chores in the household, they are happy to take it. They actually enjoy it. The reason why they enjoy is they, they enjoy the feelings that they have, they were able to con uh, take care of themselves and they were enjoying the feelings that they are uh, able to contribute to the family and make an impact. In certain sense, like let's say, like uh, when your kids like learn how to cook, and when he or she can prepare one dish for dinner, and you all like enjoy it, and the sense of accomplishments, like make make them addicted to uh, cooking. So, um, so when we were nurturing, um, um, we will talk a little bit more later on how to uh, build up confidence in this area. But eventually, if they get more confidence, they will enjoy responsibility in serving you and serving the family and serving others too. Okay. Number seven is they don't need praise. So we search so that like competence comes with time and effort. The more time and effort that they spend on it, they will get more competence and eventually they will be more confident. Like even though you don't praise about him, uh, you don't like make a big fuss about, oh, why I use this? Uh, you have done a great job in it. I'm so proud of you. Um, they, they don't need that. They just, they have the sense to know that where I am good at it. So even though they, you don't praise them, you just encourage them to keep trying and not give up that eventually they will build confidence in that area. Number eight is they show resilience. This one, this sign is really hard, really hard to observe because most of the time uh, when they were having setback or struggling or failure, we jump in too fast. We jump in too fast to help them um, because we do have the urge to help them, right? We feel like they need help and uh, we, we have the urge to help them. But if you want to see how, um, how strong is your kid in this like um, problem solving, resilience and never give up, you will have to like um, step back and like just wait for it to happen. It is hard, but if you really want to know uh, the resilience level of your kid, you will need to have a uh, patient and wait, okay? Uh, the last one is they like to help others. And um, this is similar to the point number six that they enjoy responsibility because it's the sense that they are making a difference, make them feel power of it. So um, <clears throat> sometimes they may not do a good job, but it's a sense of like, I, I can be in charge of this. I can make a difference. I can help others. Uh, is that like uh, make them feel, feel more confident? Okay. So these are the like um, the signs that you want to look for if you want, uh, if we're talking about like a confidence kids. So we're going to talk about how. Okay. I'm going to share with you a very short video that is less than one minute. Can Samuel help? On the sixth day, God said, let the earth make every sort of animal. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock and small animals, each able to have babies of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image to be like us. So God created man in his own image. He formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man, and a man became alive. Then he saw that the man needed a helper, so God put man into a deep sleep. And while he slept, God took one of the man's ribs. Then God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. Uh -oh. Hi. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, 
Fill the earth and rule over it. Rule over the fish in the sea, Hello, the, rain, the birds in the sky, Hello, bird. and all the animals that scurry along the ground. <laughs> then God said, Look, I have given you every plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given you every green plant as food for all the animals. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was done. So on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and said it was holy. I, I apologize. I believe that um, uh, Ms. Chung is just left the room for a minute. So um, hold on a second, please. Oh, oh Ms. Ms. Chung, are you here? Oh, hold on a minute. Let me go ahead and... I apologize for the technical difficulty. Hold on a minute, please. Okay. Okay. Can you share the next slide, and Of course. I think we can skip the video. Okay. So basically, the video is talking about when God creates the world, right? When we talk about parenting, it's always back to what is God's original plan. I think that your kids can share with you, like, how does God create the world? They were very familiar with it. So when God creates the world, he, uh, after he creates man, he told us that to be fruitful and increase in number and, and rule over the fish and the sea. And we, I just want to take three big screenshot for... Uh, from this story so that we can have a better concept on like uh, what how, what to do when we try to build in uh, children's confidence and the next one is like um, <clears throat> when when Adam and Eve is in the uh, Eden is in the garden like God said that you can free from eating any trees in this garden but you not must not eat the trees from the knowledge of good and evil okay the last concept we want to take from this story is that like before, before they ate the food from the knowledge, uh, the tree of knowledge, um, Adam and his wife were both naked. They feel no shame. Shame only come after, after they, they eaten what God told us not to do. So um, in this slide, we want to say like, like um, the main point is shame it's not God's original plan, okay? Mm -hmm. So what can we learn from this free um, aspect of this story? Is that like when we are teaching a child to be independent, we should set age appropriate goal. So we have our end goal in mind that like they can dependently uh, take care of themselves, but we have to break it down into small steps. So age appropriate, we like uh, in terms of uh, uh, the number, the amount of screen times on and, and like how we want to have them to manage step by step. Uh, second is we gave them a choice. So they have to have a sense of control in their life. So we gave them free choice, but we set boundaries. Okay. Um, this is very tricky. It depends like how you manage it. Let's say like uh, we tell them that you must be in bed for at before 9 p.m. But you have to have the choice to when to take shower and when to pack your school bag. So they feel like they have a choice, but eventually you have to set the boundaries so they, you know that like um, everything must be done before 9. So each day you we remember remind them that like your boundaries that you, everything must be done before nine. And you ask them, what are their plans? 
So they have to first make a plan and tell you about their plan. Like, oh, I plan to pack my school bag at 8 and like uh, take a shower by 8.30. So you would say, okay, because it's still within your boundary. Or, <clears throat> or let's say about screen time. So when you set the boundaries, like the whole day, you only have two hours screen time, then you can make a, ask them to make a plan. You can have a freedom of choice on how you would like to spend it. Okay, but you will have, it's better for screen time, it's better for them to uh, return their plan to you and you stick it in the fridge so that it's visible, they won't be forgetting, right? So uh, in that case, like if you have applied this kind of like rules in most of the aspects at home, um, they can feel like to, oh yes, I can take control of my life as long as I'm still applying to the boundaries. So this is a very good strategy. So last, um, last tips is we always use encourage word. We remember when God first made us, shame is not in the pictures. So whenever they fail, we only like, we don't like, oh, uh, see, like you have promised me and you fell, you broke my trust and how can I trust you again? So we don't go to that approach. We just encourage them. Um, with patience and uh, with encouraging words. So we will start with what's happening, what went wrong. So you ask them like why it doesn't go like their plan so that they can feel back a little bit. So um, <clears throat> next is like, uh, so where should we start? Like we, we have the big picture in mind. We know that how were the sign of the confidence and kids and like we know that three rules that is setting age appropriate uh, task, like giving them a choice with boundaries and we use encourage them works, okay? So where to start? So remember, independency comes from competence. And remember, we also talk about that apart from professional, the academic achievement, we still have to nurture their life skills, resilience, and the organization skills and study skills. Those are very important too, because like academic achievements only one third out of the whole competency, right? So we can start from here. In order to, um, in order to like for them to start competence with life, life skills, and problem solving, they have to start learning how to take care of themselves, okay? These are like uh, age-appropriate life skills that you can start from, okay? And this is for age five, six, and seven. If you want, you can take a picture. And the next size is, is for age eight and nine, okay? Um, if you want the, um, if your child is more older than that and everything here listed, he, they can master it already. I think you will have a very independent kid because this kind of things, like this kind of list involves they plan, not only they plan for their own breakfast, they plan for their whole meal for family and they go out to buy grocery and they plan how to cook it. And they plan, you can see by age line, they can plan a balanced healthy meal for the family. That means like, like, by the age of nine, they should be able to, able to uh, take care of the whole family. So the last one I want to share is the key to success, to success, okay? Remember when they were young, even though they were so messy, we still encourage them to eat by themselves, right? The whole floor is full of food. Like every time it's messy, they have food in their hair and they have food all around their body, right? And also when you do pot, uh, potty training, you feel like you know that those kind of life skills is very important to their life. But imagine if they learn how to use the toilet, but they're not using it anymore after they learn the skills. You can imagine they were still in the diapers when they're in primary school. So the most important thing is once you teach them all the life skills that we were so on the previous two slides, you ask them to keep practicing, take part in the family so that they can feel that they can have a sense to contribute. They will enjoy helping you guys. And eventually the more competent they are, they can be more independent, okay? 
And this is what I want to share with you today. And I'll pass the time to Mr. Grayson. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Kirsty. Um, wonderful being able to share that. Uh, for my presentation, it's actually more generated for all ages including um, both young, uh, um, simply because my role here at Christian Alliance International School is school-wide. Um, so I want to make sure that it is quite broad uh, so it can relate to quite a few of you. And so um, again, my name is Charles Grayson. I'm the head of student services here, and I'm going to be touching on the motivation to learn. And so one of the questions before we even start is, you know, what is motivation? And so motivation is reason or reasons for acting or behaving in certain way or manner. Um, and so, you know, we all know that there's likely two motivations that, you know, were brought up or at least taught in terms of intrinsic or extrinsic motivators. Uh, one being intrinsic, it's our natural ability to actually be able to motivate um, ourselves. And then the um, other one is ex like extrinsic. So those are the motivators that we have. Maybe it's a reward. Maybe it's a sticker that we enjoy. Maybe it's a gift that someone is actually um, going to get. And so there's purpose in terms of why they're doing what they're doing. And so as we think about it, the philosophy actually behind motivation, uh, next slide, is motivation is, is a little bit more than intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. There, it's actually goal-oriented behaviors that we begin to think about. It also uses our social, emotional, biological, as well as cognitive abilities that stimulate both our desirable as well as our undesirable behaviors in terms of why we do what we do. So if you think about it in a sense, you know, uh, think about a crime being committed in the sense, you know, one of the first questions that they tend to always ask is what was the motivation for why they did what they did. And so, you know, everyone, that part of it is actually very important to know that how your child is actually motivated to learn or what moves them to actually learn. And so challenge, incentive, development, power, opportunity, these are all things that actually are part of the motivation cycle as well. Now, part of the motivation is not just motivation, but it's also the learning part. And so what does it actually mean to learn. And so by the Oxford Dictionary, learning is acquiring knowledge in a skill by study, experience, or actually being taught. Now this is very important to us here at Christian Alliance International School for one primary reason. CIS mission statement is actually includes the learning part where our mission is to cultivate learners with knowledge, skills, integrity, and discernment, growing in love for God ser and service to humanity. And so when we think about learning, it's, it's more than, you know, just something that is, is learned and taught. Sometimes it's self-teaching self ourselves. Sometimes it's the wisdom that we're able to gain from others um, as well. And so what I'm going to be talking about is actually four areas to actually uh, motivate child learning. The first one is expectations instead of performance. Second one I'll be talking about is don't limit learning to the classroom. Third, giving influence instead of power. And fourth, creating a culture where it's okay to make mistakes. And this is quite important. And so let's start off with the first one, expectations instead of performance. So one of the biggest challenges um, from even being a parent or parents themselves is focusing too much on uh, just the performance. And so I like the quote that Albert Einstein had is that everybody is a genius, but if you, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. <laughs> and so, you know, we should have realistic expectations for our child instead of trying to just constantly move them in terms of performance. So focus on the expectations instead of the performance. When learning becomes a competition, the enjoyment from learning becomes lost. And that's something that we don't want to ever lose part of our children is that that enjoyment of constantly seeking out and developing their skill sets to become critical thinkers is lost because we're comparing them to 
another sibling, another child that they have are constantly telling them that they need to do something else. And so one of the things is find that enjoyment in your child by asking him or her, what have you learned today? You know, maybe it's a certain day where they're not going to be able to recall everything that they learned, but you can certainly find out what it is that they really took with them back home. So it is, what did you actually learn today? Well, you know, what are the things that you actually learned today? And those were some of the things that my parents actually did for me as well. You know, the kitchen table is actually very important where you would be able to develop those skill sets where you're meeting with your child, having those conversations over meal and being able to discuss because that's the best way to actually learn and get to build further relationships with your child. And so there is research that finds that successful and motivated children have parents who are actually involved and responsive. Now, I will go into a bit of the parenting styles a bit later, but do remember that part. And then in addition to those successful and motivated children, the research also complements that setting parents who actually set high expectations but respect the autonomy of your child equally have their children who are um, very successful in life as well. And so for the next one, it's give influence instead of power. And so these are important as well. Uh, for the first one, it's influence your child. Influence actually helps your child to see the purpose of learning. It becomes more or less this catalyst for them. Um, for your child to see that learning is actually enjoyable if they're able to see that their own parents are supportive and not necessarily forcing them to do something. And so, you know, um, we just had Pastor uh, McCoy that was able to speak about that as well. Being example for your child and them being able to see that you take this seriously goes a very long way for them. Secondly, Power creates pressure and intimidates a child to learn. Now, while the child will perform, certainly they will perform, the performance is actually a tie to the parental or adult control versus them actually being able to develop a genuine appreciation for learning, growth, and development. And so that's something that we wanna make sure that the child is actually able to do on their own without them actually being forced to do it by their parents. Now, there's a wonderful um, clinician. She was a psychologist. She passed away um, in 2018, um, but she was the one who actually founded the principal st uh, parenting styles, excuse me. Um, and she was a professor, a clinical psychologist, as well as a sociologist um, from uh, the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and her name was Dr. Uh, Diana Bomren, and she found that authoritative parents tend to raise children who fare better academically, psychologically, and socially than children with passive or uninvolved or even controlling parents. And then if we move on with the authoritative parents, they actually provide space for motivating learning to happen naturally. And again, we'll go into those different parenting styles um, at the end. Um, but touching upon my, neck, my third point, don't limit learning to the classroom. Now, this is an individual that I absolutely admired when I was doing my master's in education as well. Uh, this individual is Dewey, John Dewey, who's a psychologist as well as a philosopher. One of his best quotes that he has is, education is not preparation for life, Education is life itself. And so that's truly something to think about. Education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. Because the reality is that you're constantly learning every day of your life. There's always something that you didn't know. And you're constantly building a child who becomes inquisitive and desires to learn more as well. And so John Dewey was actually the father of modern um, experiential education. And so Dewey provided the ideas of applicability and learning uh, in that learning was essential for making learning relevant by applying our thoughts and experiences to learning. 
And so really, you know, getting outside of the classroom and going outside in the real world or maybe at the playground, being able to socialize, maybe interact and getting knowledge from other students as well. That was something that he, he admired, which is the concept that he developed in terms of, um, which is called pragmatic learning um, in that ability. And so for the fourth uh, one to touch on today, tonight, is create a culture where it is okay to make mistakes. Um, and I just love this quote uh, where it says, the most viable thing you can make is a mistake. You can't learn anything from being perfect. So the most viable thing that you can make is a mistake. You can't learn anything from being perfect. And the reality is that none of us are perfect. And trying to place then that pressure on your child actually does more damage to them emotionally and mentally than anything else. And there is, it does more or less play into when a child actually matures, whether or not they actually believe that they're good enough because they haven't had that ability to develop that resiliency as uh, Ms. Kersey was talking about. And so mistakes are in fact unavoidable when growing up. And the idea is to create opportunities out of those mistakes in order to constantly develop a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Now the growth mindset tells us, you know what, this can get better. I can do this. These are things that I can achieve versus a fixed mindset, which constantly places you within the boundaries of, you know what, I'm never going to be able to accomplish this task. I've been making RSs in this subject for I don't know how long. So it, you know what, I should just stop even trying. What's the purpose of even trying to do this any further? I'm not gonna get working above. And so we will constantly wanna be making sure that we are encouraging our children and developing within them a growth mindset. And so developing a healthy mind involves spending time processing and building or cultivating critical thinking skills. It should never be an instance in which the child is just selling for a status quo. You know, it is what it is, and I'm just going to leave it at that. No. And so part of being a parent is not that you would be doing everything for your child, because your child doesn't need that. What they do need is encouragement. Not to be praised necessarily, but encouragement. Encouragement goes a long way, which lets the child know, you know what, my mom and dad actually support me. They are aware because I see that they are able to acknowledge. And I, I believe the most successful parents that I have seen have been those parents who are able to balance praising their child, but more importantly, influencing their child and acknowledging, you know what, you can do this. And I know it's difficult now, but you, as more and more you practice, this will get better for you. And so mistakes are actually the bridge for children to develop a greater sense of resiliency. And that's ultimately what we want to, to see the child do. Now, for those who are not native English speakers, I will just touch briefly on resiliency. So resiliency is actually the child's ability to actually bounce back more or less from when they fall down. You know, if there's a setback in their life that they don't believe that it's going to be their only setback. They have the ability to actually almost self-encourage themselves to say, you know what, this happened to me, but I am more than this, and I'm going to get past this, and I can get past this. And so it's that positive, it, it even ties into the positive self-talk aspect where your child actually becomes resilient in that. And so doing these things for your child, you know, maybe if you're doing something for your child and it's actually unnecessarily doing something for your child, or prematurely, it can actually reduce the motivation and increase a level of dependency, where it's like, oh, I don't need to do this because if I do that, I already know that my parents are gonna take care of it. Mom and dad already has this covered. So why would I need to do that? Like, there's no point of me doing it because, you know, mom and dad are now working for me. <laughs> and that's not really this, that's not really what you want your child to develop is a sense of dependency because ultimately the goal is that they would be able to mature and develop levels of independency. So what does the actual Bible, what does the Bible tells us and what does the Bible instruct us um, as parents? So the Bible says, Proverbs 22, 6, train up 
a child in the way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, this is important because it's a child, so, sort of that, that mantra of, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. And so even raising up a child or training a child is actually part of not only teachers, but family members, whomever that the child actually becomes involved with. But it is important that I highlight the Hebrew in the way he should go is actually a noun denoting his way or a child in the way that a child is bent. And so oftentimes parents actually confuse this part, train up a child in the way that he should go so that when he is older, he will not depart from it. This scripture does not mean that your child is to live vicariously through you. That's not what it means at all. So that's a mistake, a common mistake through the scriptures that parents actually use. Now, I don't mean to preach, but I did come to share a word. So, <laughs> so it does mean that in, you should be training up the child in the way that he is actually bent. Now, what does that mean, Mr. Grayson, in terms of training up a child in the way that he is bent? So you should be thinking of it in sense of a bow and arrow. Now, bow and arrows are made to be bent. They are curved in a specific way, and there's a string attached to it that's quite taut, so it's tight. Now, when you pull that, that arrow back, it provides for it just the right level of buoyancy for the arrow to shoot in a specific way. Now, if in fact you start to bend that bow and arrow too far or in the wrong direction, one of two things will happen. Either when you shoot your arrow, it will go the wrong way, or the bow will actually break. And so what this Bible is, what the scripture is actually addressing is that God has already naturally placed instincts and desire within your child in terms of how God wishes for your child to actually grow up and for them to develop their characters, their purpose, all of these things that they have are apart from your desires that you have for your child. Oh, my child, I went to Harvard, so, or I didn't get to go to Harvard, so therefore I want my child to go to Harvard. Uh, you know, I didn't get to go to HKU, or I went to HKU, but you know what? My child should also be going to HKU. You know, while these are excellent colleges and institutions, every child is not made for that because that takes away the fact that God places his children where he wants them to be. And so this is very important to, to highlight because oftentimes this scripture is taken out of context. So sermon ended. But moving forward, the parenting styles. So for the parenting styles, there are four parenting styles. The authoritarian parenting style, which says generally leads to children who are obedient and proficient but they actually rank lower in happiness and social competence and even self-esteem. But then as we move over, there's the authoritative parenting style. This actually one is a lot more, this is, is better because this style tends to result in children who are happy, capable, and actually successful as well. And then there's the third one, the permissive parent. Yeah, often results in children who rank low, in happiness and self-regulation, these are children are more likely to experience problems with authority and tend to perform poorly in school. Because the parents don't mind, then you know, the child actually develops that similar behavior that they're learning from you. And then finally, it's the uninvolved parent. You know, these styles actually rank the lowest across all of the domains. And these uh, children tend to lack self-control and have low self-esteem and are actually less competent uh, than their peers. Now, these parenting styles were actually developed in about the 1980s by Dr. Diana uh, Berman, as I was mentioning before. And she actually developed the first three. The fourth one was actually developed by um, individuals known as McElvey um, and McCoy. They actually went on to develop a, a fourth one of the parenting styles that they begin to see. Now, the data that they collected was actually from uh, preschool parents, and it was actually systematic in terms of following those children up to see how they actually improved. And so they used surveys as well, and then parent interviews. 
that they were able to select in order to decide the best sort of parenting style. And so, so that's actually the motivation side of it. Now, I just want to pivot just a bit because, you know, as you are parents, you will be working with the school. And so there are some tips for working with CAIS teachers and uh, student services, uh, which is the department uh, that I lead. And so here are some tips for you all. For the first one, place the needs of your child above the perception of the services that we offer. This is extremely important because oftentimes it is this stigma because of student services. Yes, we deal with university work. Yes, we deal with mental health. Yes, we deal with learning support. But if your child need, has learning support needs, you should not associate, oh my goodness, I don't want my child to be labeled with the fact that you don't want to provide your child service. Because essentially there is an opportunity for your child to actually improve where they would no longer need the support of learning support. But if they're being provided the support too late, it actually means that there's a, a, you know, a widespread gap that actually needs to be met in order to make sure that the student is actually bought up to speed where they need to be. Then from that one, my other tip is to be aware of what your child needs. You know, so be, be aware of your child needs, advocate for them. You should never dismiss your child and when they said, you know, I, I'm not doing well in school and I feel as though that, you know, something's wrong. Like I'm, I'm having these thoughts that I shouldn't be having. You know, mentally, I just don't think I'm there, mom. And I, I think I need to see a doctor or a psychologist or a counselor. Don't ignore that. Advocate for your child. And your child is actually able to build independence through dependency in some forms when they see that you're actually able to encourage them to actually step forward. Moving from there, inform us of any updates or threats or concerns or changes in your child's behaviors that you've actually noticed at home. Now, this is important because you know, we do our best here at the school to really meet and love every student that is here and try our best to work with them. But there are limitations because, you know, there comes those times where we cannot watch over every single student and know how they're feeling in every single time because students tend to put on a face, you know. It's a Hong Kong thing where my wife tells me she's local as well that, you know, it's easy to put on a face you know, just to pretend like everything's fine. But we don't want our children to be putting on a face in front of our students, uh, in front of their teachers or in front of their principals or anything like that. So if you know that there's something going on with your child and their behaviors have changed at home, let us know so that we can help you. And then finally, if your ch well, not finally, but if your child has been assessed by a psychologist, and has a diagnosis for a learning support need, don't wait until your child is failing before disclosing that helpful information. You know, we, we can't help your child. We can help your child if they're receiving RSs, but we would have been able to do so much more without your child having to get to that level of feeling just, oh, there's, I don't know why I'm doing so bad. I don't know why I'm doing so bad, I'm stupid, I'm, I'm just not making it. When in reality, your child actually has needs that are so specific that they actually must be met by our learning support team. And then let us know if something is not working. This is the next one. Let us know if something is not working. You know, if we're doing something or if there's something that you know that it's actually not working, be it in the classroom, with your, your child's teachers, let us know that something is actually not working. And then finally, the, the last tip I have is to be patient, is to be patient. Um, this does take time and it takes a coordinated effort from us all in order to best be able to provide uh, meeting the needs for your child. And so, you know, these are some of the tips that I have as well as for working 
in, in terms of motivation and learning uh, as well as working with us. And so I, the responsibility is actually shared with the school as well as with the parents and making sure that we actually train up your children um, in the way that God has actually desired for them to go. Because if we do not teach, and if you do not teach your children to follow Christ, the world will teach them how not to. And I think the best quote that I, I, I ever heard is, if we don't teach our children who God is, or everything that God is, someone will teach them everything that he isn't. Mm. So. Okay, so coming to the last part that we're like, well, we would like to talk about like when to sit help. Uh, we won't go through point by point, like uh, maybe we can find a way that like uh, we can send you the slide afterwards so that you can like uh, overrule like uh, all the points. So when we will talk about signs that you want to look for. The first signs to look for is like whether your kids have constantly feeling anxious, like whether they have signs for uh, anxiety. So um, uh, these are the signs, but uh, like look at the last, the second last one. It's like it's suddenly a void, um, not this one. So it's just the one for anxiety. No. So go back to the, the first slide. Yes. So you can see at the bottom, it said like suddenly avoid social contact. Like if you see your child's like uh, the most common way is they have stomach ache every time in the morning and they just don't want to go to school. Oh, I have to, uh, I have case before that like every time they are, there is a test, they're not feeling well. So if you pay more attention to it, like uh, you can like spot whether like um, your, your kids is anxious about school or, or like anxious about school life. And one of the like uh, typical, uh, not typical, but like you have to be very mindful about is the social anxiety, which is the leg side. Um, social anxiety is like your child is fine in, at home he, she, he or she is energetic, happy girl, um, all around it, he jokes around. But at school, he or she is not, it's like a total different person, right? He's not talking, he's not like, don't like to uh, interact with others. Like this kind of signs that like, uh, is your children is like feeling anxious at school. And uh, like for this kind of social anxiety, we have to treat immediately. We cannot wait because the more we wait, that means like every day that like when she is in school or he is in school, he suffers a lot with that anxiety. So next one is the early sign of whether your children is having learning needs. Learning needs like uh, is come, um, we come known as like dyslexia but actually it's a little bit more than dyslexia. We have dyscalcia and a lot of type of different specific learning needs. So if you, um, but it is a common, um, most of the time, like the parents don't uh, feel like they don't want to go in that direction and look in too deep. It's because uh, they feel like, oh, my child is just a slow learner. They will eventually get there. But most of the time, well, uh, uh, what we experience is they eventually the learning gap is getting bigger. They're falling behind more and more with their peers. And when they, when we notice this is we really take tons of effort. Like uh, if we can spot it earlier, we can help as soon as possible. So uh, the next one is uh, early sign for attention needs. Right, um, most of the children, like uh, we were, like forgetful and is thinking. They, but one of the point that you will, you want to pay attention about is they constantly changing tasks, like everything at home, halfly done, shifting from task to task. Things are everywhere on the floor. Um, he will like when he's working on some uh, task A, like for five minutes, he think of something and start 
task B. So these are the signs that you want to look for whether your child is having attention needs. And if you spot some of them, you should let us know earlier so that we can do a lot of uh, observations and uh, we can help them immediately. Uh, last is the signs uh, of students having or kids having social needs. Uh, <clears throat> if, if you observe that your child, they prefer to play alone, or sometimes they're willing to interact with others only when they want something to be done. So these are the signs that you want to um, uh, be cautious about. Um, uh, the last side is like, why we're talking about the sign is because there is a golden hour. Like when we have a stroke or heart attack, the first hour is golden, right? Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> golden hours means like as that is the golden window for us to impact, um, to increase um, their recovery and like mm -hmm. to pretend and to make sure that they have a quality life afterward. So whenever like you see signs that we mentioned, make sure you tell us so that we can have early interventions. Mm -hmm. The more early we intervene, the less gap between they, um, their learning with their peers. Mm -hmm. As long as we keep the gap between the uh, peers small, um, they are fine. So when you think of like when to seek help, it is now. <laughs> so if you feel like your, your child is like uh, having signs that we mentioned, don't hesitate. Just call us, right? You know our general office number. Call the general office. Like uh, I want to talk to um, Miss Kirsty, the primary school counselor, or you want to talk to Mr. Chuck Grayson. So we are all here to help. If you have worry about uh, whether my child will get labeled or they have mistreatment, to mistreat, that, that don't worry about. We are uh, all open to share with you, like uh, what is our procedures, how we handle your information, and like we are here to answer all questions. Okay, so Sam, we uh, like to take over the yeah, AMA section. Yeah, um, thank you, parents, and thank you, speakers. Let's just give them a round of a quick applause. You know, we can't really see you. <laughs> thank you, and for your parents too. Yeah, um, sorry, we did go over time. I know we were scheduled from seven to eight p.m., but it is eight twenty. But I just have um, I, I do have one question from uh, a parent uh, that shared. Um, and perhaps maybe you can clarify uh, well, both Charles and also for uh, Miss Kirsty as well. And the question is, what kind of behavior does an authoritative parent exhibit? So that's actually a very good question. One of the things that um, tip generally comes out the most is that the parent is actually more reasonable than anything else. Um, and that they're actually, um, they, the, they set very clear expectations for their child um, as well as disciplinary rules. It could be um, their communication with their child is actually very frequent, um, mixed with being yet appropriate for the child um, in terms of the consequences that they have. Um, and they're able to really state those things uh, clearly uh, to them. And it's, it's apparent, I would say, equally that is uh, nurturing. Um, one that is self-disciplined. These are some of the more or less the traits or characteristics that you come to find with an authoritative parent. Now, that it tends to be confusing with uh, authoritarian parents who do little in terms of, you know, they're the ones that tell a child, you know, don't do that again, or the next time you do that, there's going to be a consequence or a punishment, but, you know, they don't really provide an actual baseline or level or follow through in terms of the consequence for the child. And then the parenting styles typically are less nurturing. And so the child is actually able to see that. Expectations are actually way too high for an authoritarian parent. And there's like no flexibility that would be able to come with it. And so those are the differences between an authoritarian and authoritative parenting styles. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, um, I just have one other qu um, question, but I think this is... Um, uh, there was a question in regards to can the presentation be shared and um, I guess that kind of leads up to closing this event which is that 
uh, we will send out both. Uh, I think we can do a PDF version of the PowerPoint slide that all of you saw today. Mm -hmm. and we'll send that through Connect Weekly, as well as for those of you, if there are certain portions of the video that you would like to go back and rewatch, that will also be made available for the Connect Weekly as well. So that will be done uh, next week. Um, I think, it, um, yeah. So yeah, thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much. This is our first parent uh, education event. So Thank you for all of you for joining us here today. Uh, a round of applause for all of you. So thanks for sticking with it. Um, before we close, I'm just gonna ask uh, Mr. Vanderpeil to just join us and then just close with prayer, just to bless this evening and to all of our parents as well as our speakers here today. So Richard, if you can go ahead and pray for us, yes. Oh wait, um, oh, I need to unmute you after, after I unmute you, of course. <laughs> Let me just do that. All right, all right, go ahead. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yep, that's it. That was an example of an authoritarian teacher who wouldn't unmute me. So, uh, but anyway, <laughs> thank you, Sam. Sam, can I just on behalf of the staff here uh, who have been involved, but also the parents, thank you very much for being the person who, who has really organized this event. I know that there have been a team of people, uh, others, Rodi in particular, who have really helped to make this happen. But uh, I think a round of applause for you, Sam. Thank you very much for your work that you've done. And parents, it has just been wonderful. As Sam said, this is the first, we hope, of a number of events of just building uh, that home and school relationship. I know ultimately we would love to be face-to-face -face in our lecture hall, but uh, this is as good as it gets for the moment. I wish you all a most wonderful weekend. And uh, let me just close very briefly in prayer. Charles, thank you. Kirsty, thank you. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and expertise. And I just love the links back to scripture uh, because that is where truth is and where it begins. So let me pray. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, it is about our children. It's the children that we love and we love them dearly. And we desire them to grow up to be young men and young women of righteousness, to be people of good stature to be people who will hold themselves well in the society that they grow up in. And so, Father, we thank you for the wisdom and the advice that's been shared this evening. But Lord, as it says in James, we should not merely be hearers of the word, but also doers. And so, Father, we pray for strength and grace and wisdom on our parents as they just put in place uh, boundaries and encouragement and praise uh, and just enabling our children to be uh, those young men and women that, Father, they will grow into. Father, we thank you for this time. Bless our weekend, and we look forward to school again on Monday. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, thank you for joining us. Everyone, this. have a lovely, lovely rest of the evening. Thank you, all right, take care. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. See you. See bye. you. Bye.